Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge. My two guests are part of a royal Broadway family. The dad is known for 16 Broadway shows, including Caroline or Change, Chicago, Finian's Rainbow, The Prince of Broadway, and from his Tony Awarding role, Tony Award winning role of Memphis in the musical The Life. His daughter is known from such shows as Spring Awakening, Wicked, SpongeBob SquarePants, and her star turn as Julie in the musical Tootsie. And this coming Sunday afternoon, May 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, they will be in concert with Seth Rudesky as part of his Seth Concert Series that streams right here at Broadway World. Please say hello to my friends, Chuck and Lily Cooper. Hi. Hello. Now, it is so great to see you two. Lily, I saw you on the street the other day. First of all, tell me where the two of you are. Lily, where are you? I'm in Harlem in my apartment with my two dogs. My husband's out at work, so it's just me and the pups today. Okay. And Chuck, where are you? I am on a lake in West Milford, New Jersey. This is our lake. Beautiful. And that's where we'll be doing the concert on Sunday. So I get to go up out to the lake um, yeah. and spend time out at the oh. lake house. We're going to get into this because I was going to figure out where that was all going to take place. Yeah. But, you know, what I wanted to say to both of you, what has this year been like for the two of you? Because I've been talking to celebrities all around the world, Cherry Jones as far as Switzerland, people in the building, people at homes, people who are married, people living by themselves. So, Lily, what has this year been like for you and your husband? Yeah, well, this year has really been focused on the fact that we're bringing a new life into the world. Um, cause we found out like in the very beginning of January. So this year has really been all about that. Um, which is really exciting and amazing and makes us very happy. Uh, I was traveling a little bit in the beginning of the year. I was in Canada. I was shooting a TV show. Um, so I was really, really lucky to be able to, to work. And, um, then coming back home, I've been really bored to be honest, very bored you know, trying to stay busy any way possible. I'm teaching master classes and doing voice lessons and stuff, which I love, um, you know, concerts here and there, uh, but just trying to stay busy and, you know, not go crazy. Well, I want to congratulate you and your husband, Paul, because you have a baby boy coming very soon, right? Yeah, we do. September. We're expecting in September. Congratulations. Okay, Chuck, how excited are you? Uh, I, I can barely contain myself. Uh, you know, my I often say when I'm talking about my children that my cheeks are sore from smiling. Well, now they, they ache. They ache. I'm just like, ah, ah, I'm so happy. <laughs> it's like it's that, it's like, uh, that is so uh, great. That, yeah, it's just like, it's a happiness that you can't uh, describe. There's no words for it. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, listen. This coming Sunday afternoon, May 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you'll both be doing a concert together with Seth Rudetsky as part of his Seth Concert Series that streams right here at Broadway World. How excited are the two of you? Oh, man. I'm really excited. Yeah. We've It'll sung together a few times. We've done a few concerts, um, usually with my brother, Eddie. Uh, we call ourselves the Cooper Clan. Um, <laughs> And it's always just like such a joy. It's so much fun to be able to perform, perform with each other. So uh, when Seth asked us to do this, I thought it was just a great opportunity to, you know, perform together again, which is always yeah. so much fun. It's so, so now, much where fun. Are gonna, where are you going to do it now? Tell me where you're going to film Sunday. We're going to be out here at, at our place in West Milford. Um, and Lily, you know, you were thinking about doing it in front of the fireplace. I was wondering if we should like maybe move the dining room table out and do it in the dining room with, with the lake and the, at the backdrop. Yeah, I like that idea. That's good. That's because yeah. that's a good amount of space too that we could use. Yeah, yeah. So but yeah, we're going to be out here in West Milford, which is about an hour from Manhattan. It's not too far. See, I love this. I've seen all of the Seth concerts. And like I said, I think you two are going to judge this up the most where you're giving us a lake view and everything else. So it's going to be great. I mean, what can your fans expect? Like what kind of songs you both going to sing? What composers, what shows, what can you tell us? I'm throwing out a lot of musical theater. 
I just like miss it so much and like need it. And there's songs that I love to listen to and particularly love to perform. So I'm going to throw out a lot of show tunes for you. Yeah, me, you me too. Most of mine are, are show tunes. Uh, I have, I think I have one jazz standard. Um, yeah, but the rest are from shows. Now, with shows, these shows, shows, you shows I've done, shows I would like to have done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are these some of the shows you'd like to have done or roles? For sure, yeah. There's. I'm going to sing a song from a show I have done and definitely songs from shows that I would love to do in the future. So it's kind of like my, hey, guys, theater's <laughs> coming back. Remember me? <laughs> Might there be a duet in there somewhere? For sure. Of course. I love this. Okay, have have you rehearsed over like StreamYard or Zoom? Like, what have you been doing for prepping for Sunday YouTube? You know, we haven't really. I mean, I think these are these are the songs that we're singing are songs that we've like sung before and we're pretty comfortable with. Um, but Seth is like such a genius. I feel like it's kind of going to be one of those things where he just like plays the piano for us and we sing, and it's going to be great. It's going to be um, live theater. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's going to be live. We might forget a word or two, but that's just, that's how it works. <laughs> okay. What is it like performing with Seth? Because you've both done it before. You never know what it's going to be like. What is it like performing with Seth? I think it's hilarious. He just put out on TikTok that there's going to be a sing-off competition, apparently. Like, Somebody has to submit a video of them singing the Dark I Know Well from Spring Awakening. And that the, the video that wins is gonna be um shown on the on the show. And I didn't know about that. So I feel like he's always gonna just like throw us, you know, some random stuff that's gonna be fun and funny. Uh, I, we can definitely count on Seth to keep it live. <laughs> See what's great about this sing off is I believe that the winner win some free tickets to a concert, which I think is what it's all about too, which is really oh. exciting. Oh, wow. That's such now, a great have idea. You chosen, have you chosen your outfits yet? Now, I'm sure your your weight has changed, Lily, over this year as you're, you know, getting ready to have a baby. I mean, you know. Not only most, hers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get into yours, Chuck. But I mean, Lily, have you chosen an outfit? What you're going to wear on Sunday? Well, just before the broadcast started, I got a delivery and I had to, you know, calm my dogs down from barking at the doorbell. And those are some outfits that I'm going to try on the second this interview stops to see if they'll work. So I don't know yet, but we'll see. <laughs> Cross my fingers. Now, Chuck, what about for you? I don't know. We're going to see what, uh, how, how badly the pandemic pounds have uh, infected my hips. And, and basically I'll be wearing what I can wear. <laughs> you know, it's been really interesting because you know, the theater's getting ready to open here in New York, September 14th, Broadway's gonna kick back. How excited are the two of you about that? How do you hope the theater will come back? How inclusive do you hope it is? Like, what are your thoughts, Lily? I'll start with you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting, it's scary, it's confusing. I, I mean, you know, I actually haven't even heard about any specific protocols that are going into place. So I, I have no idea how it's going to happen. Um, I think one thing that I find th that I think is really important is that we just continue to have conversations about making spaces feel as safe as possible for everybody in the theater. Um, uh, you know, I know after a year and a half of not working, people need to go back to work and they need their health insurance and they need a paycheck every week. And so I'm really, really glad that people will be able to do that. Um, and at the same time, I think that um, we'll probably have to make some sacrifices in order to really delve deeply back into what Broadway is. Uh, so I'm excited and nervous and mm -hmm. I will see what happens. I don't know. I don't know what to expect really. Uh, Talk for you. I, I well, uh, first off, uh, uh, I'll, it'll be so great for all the many people who who make Broadway happen to to get back to work and ha and have a job, and maybe some of those that that had to leave town and 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 whatnot can come back and 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 all like that. Um, but beyond that, my hope is that um, that the pause 
that we've all been subjected to by COVID. Um, for those of us who who, who have survived and and hopefully uh, um, you know uh, don't have uh, family and friends who, who who are no longer with us. For those of us in the theater, I, I think it's an uh, it's not the pause has been an opportunity for self reflection, and uh, and uh, I I would I would like to think of it not as going back but as going forward. And um, I, I, it is my hope that, that the gatekeepers and those of us who uh, are on the other side of the table and all, all the folks involved really, really take, take an opportunity to, to say, well, you know, maybe we could do better. And, and there are a few things that we could change and, and be mindful of and, and, and in our quest to move forward. And, and do that wonderful thing that theater does and, and teach empathy and teach teach uh, uh, collaboration and, and all those exquisite aspects of the theater. Beautifully put, because like you said, none of us know what it's gonna be like when it comes back. And I think many people have reflected over this past year. So it'll be very interesting. I, I'm Like I said, I, I just, I hope it comes back the same way you're hoping it comes back also. Well, I want to tell our audience once again that this Sunday afternoon, May 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you both will be live with Seth Rodesky as part of his Seth Concert Series that streams right here at Broadway World. The interesting thing is there's also a student ticket available now, which is great that Seth's been offering. So if you're a student and you have a .edu email address, when you go to Broadway World, sign up for a Broadway World account, put that in, and you get a big discount to these concerts now, which is really, really special. And tickets, of course, are available at Broadway World Events, at theseptconcerts.com. You can just Google Lily or Chuck, and it'll take you to some ticket site or whatever. Um, it's, of course, uh, produced by Mark Cortali and sponsored by Broadway World and StreamYard. You know, I want to go back to the beginning. Lily, do you re how old were you when you realized what your dad did for a living working in show business? How old were you? I was probably, <clears throat> I was like five or six. The first Broadway show that I remember is um, How to Get Away with Murder? Getting Away with Murder? Oh, getting Away with Murder, which did not. <laughs> which, they didn't get away with it. Um, <laughs> which was a play. Um, and I think I was like four or five. And I remember being backstage at that. And I remember seeing that. Um, on Broadway, and that that and the funny thing is, I actually don't remember what my broad my first Broadway show is because I was just like so fully immersed in it always that I, it, it like my first one didn't really stand out to me. So um, I, but like my my best fondest like most kind of like distinct memory of my of my dad being an actor and realizing what he did was being backstage at the life which i think is hilarious because i was seven and that show is all about uh sex workers and pimps and drug dealers in new york city in the 80s and so so i was like little seven-year-old walking around backstage like doing my homework underneath his dressing station and all the ensemble women like in their you know, booty shorts and crop tops walking around being like, hey, Lil, you want to come hang out with me? You know, it was, and it was just a dream. It was so fun. I looked up to all of these women and, and I think secretly, even though I was super shy as a kid and I really didn't start performing till later, that's when I realized that that's what I wanted to do also. That is great. You know, Nicole's going to mute me and unmute me because I think the sound issue is from my lovely Verizon here in the very <laughs> Manhattan Plaza. So I'm going to ask you a question, then she'll mute me, then I'll come back. Chuck, okay. I want Broadway debuts are very, very important, especially for both of you. I want to start with your dad. Chuck, yours was in Amen Corner. Tell me what that meant to you, what you remember about your debut. Nicole, you can mute. Uh, ah, Amen Corner. That, that goes back <laughs> more than a few years. Um, what was that like? Uh, it, it's hard to describe. I, I, I got the job uh, from an open call. Uh, back in the day, before cell phones, before computers, you would get a, a copy of Backstage or Showbiz, but most of us did Backstage. It was better than Showbiz. 
probably shouldn't say that. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, you know, and it would ha- list the auditions. And I went in, you know, there was this, they're doing this Amos and Cor- uh, Amon Corner, this James Baldwin, based on James Baldwin's play. And, uh, um, you know, it was a musical version of, of the play. And, and so I go to the audition. I sing, I don't know what, I, I probably sang whatever I always sang back then, which, you know, something terrible, like if I were a bell or something, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, and then I got, I got a call back like that day. They said, well, can you come back at two? You know, the audition was at 11. So I go back and I do my call back and they say, okay, you got the job right there and then. In the room? In the room. Whoa, that's and crazy. Was, and so I, I like, what? I have a Broadway show? How old were you? Do you remember? Oh, oh, oh gosh. I, I, I do not remember. Um, a lot younger than I am now. <laughs> was Eddie, was Eddie born yet? Uh, no, no. Eddie, Eddie was not born yet. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure Eddie was not born yet. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was fantastic. Because first of all, we 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 did a warm up kind of in D.C. So we went to, um, I guess it was Ford's Theater in D.C. And that was incredible to be at Ford's Theater. And then when we came to Broadway, I remember opening night. You know, rented a limo and. At the tux and and your mom was all decked out and and, and is that the and, picture of you and mom in the back seat of the limo where she's wearing like that first the fur? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man, she looked like a million bucks, mm-hmm. and uh, it it was it was quite a quite an experience. I mean, you only get one Broadway debut, yeah. and, and we did it. I mean, we yeah. we we did the whole nine yards. Got the, the limo and the, the party and. Yeah. and you know, it's a good thing we we enjoyed ourselves because this show didn't last for about five minutes. I saw Amen Corner though, just so you know, I saw it. So what I'm gonna do is when I put my finger up like this, Nicole can unmute me, and then you know, then I'll I'll let you answer. Lily, yours of course was as Martha in Spring Awakening. How magical was that role and that company of actors? Nicole, you could be. <laughs> um, that was such a wild, surreal experience because I was a teenager and I was in high school at the time. I went to LaGuardia uh, High School and I was a sophomore when the show opened off Broadway. And it was just this whirlwind of a process because it was a workshop straight to off Broadway. Then we got announced that we were transferring to Broadway and we moved like pretty quickly after that. Meanwhile, I'm in school, you know, doing my PSATs and looking at college applications and all of this. So I'm living this like double life as a 16 year old. Um, So it was really crazy. And I don't think any of us realized kind of the impact of that show until we were outside of it, but it was a pretty profound um, show that really made an impact, I think in the, in the Broadway canon. Right. And, uh, but we were all just kind of like young and like, this is cool. We feel really popular and we're awesome. And everybody knows who we are because we were just, you know, silly teenagers. Um, But I remember, you know, my opening night, we went to Tavern on the Green after was where our party was. And it just felt so glamorous and amazing. I'll never forget it. It's, 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 I think I went to, I think I went to class the next day. It was so, it was so strange. And, you know, throughout that whole process, I was, I had to kind of balance the two lives because I would, I would take a day off from the show. I would take a show off to go to my graduation or to go to my prom. There was even one week where I had to take a vacation from Spring Awakening to do a play at my high school because in order to like graduate with a drama diploma, I had to do a play at my high school. And I wanted to also because I wanted to share that experience with my friends and stuff. So I had to take a vacation from my Broadway show to do a play at my high school, which I thought was hilarious. (laughs) All the while maintaining an awesome grade point average as well. Yeah, I did pretty good. I wanted to ask you about you did two Sondheim shows. You did Passion and, of course, Getting Away with Murder. What was it like working with Stephen Sondheim? Nicole, you could mute me. Oh, uh, well, you know, 
Stephen Sondheim. Uh, my God, you know, the Stephen Sondheim of the American theater. What can I say about that? Um, well, first of all, for Passion, I didn't really work with Steve because I was a swing in Passion. I came into the show after they had opened, after, you know, folks had started taking their vacations and leaving the show and whatnot. So I came in as a swing, covered six tracks. I think I went on for four of the tracks. And that was where I learned that the swing is the hardest working job in show business. Uh, but uh, after that, we did, um, uh, in San Diego, we did the Doctors Out, uh, uh, which was what it was called in San Diego, the Sondheim George Firth farce it was it was a it was a play it was there was no music in it uh and i i did the 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 run out there and then when it moved to broadway they fired me they they got um uh, a big old tv star frankie Faison, to do my part and they summarily dismissed me and did not require my services <laughs> and so um Having, I think I had two kids by then. I think Eddie was was here, and maybe Alex. And so I, I remember calling up um, my agents and say, "Look, since I originated the role, maybe they would let me cover it." And so um, I, they called, and uh, Jack O'Brien was amenable to that. And so I, I was, I was a cover, I covered Frankie Faison. For the did you have to re audition or did or did they just say they, cool? They I did not have to re audition. They okay, they were they were like I guess he kind of might know how to he do knows it. it. <laughs> so they uh, the limit, that show though is my favorite showbiz show because there's such great stories from that show. Um, uh, on the Broadway run, one night uh, at the end of the first act, John Rubenstein, who's one of the stars of the show who plays this psychiatrist who ha has as his clients the seven deadly sins. Uh, his, his clients are personified as seven deadly sins. And he just, he just can't stand these people. And so in, in, in a fantasy, at the end of the first act, he takes out a revolver and shoots six of them, right? Well, this night, <laughs> the revolver didn't work. So he ran around the stage, strangling them all <laughs> in succession. <laughs> and when he got and when he got to the last one, when he got to Candice Chappelle, she just fainted dead away. She just said, I'm not doing that. She just fainted. <laughs> so um, you know, as that I, I is, always, always like to say that this that show that, uh, getting away with murder did not get away with murder. <laughs> I love it. Nicole can unmute me now. Let me see. So I want to ask you, Lily, about Wicked. You have quite a history with Elphaba. Do you remember the first time you were painted green and the first time you went on? Mute me away. Oh, yeah. So uh, Wicked was Wicked was such a gift because I, I booked that show right after college. Um, and I went on tour where I was the understudy. So I was in the ensemble every night and I was the second cover for Alphaba. So the very first time that I got painted green and the very first time I performed the role like for anybody really was my put in rehearsal, which is basically for people who don't know my full technical rehearsal with all the costumes and lights and set changes and everything. And the entire rest of the company is also there. Um, and I remember going up like on the cherry picker in Defying Gravity and all of my friends in the ensemble were in the wings, literally like hooting and hollering for me and filming me on their phones. And so I start crying as I'm singing Defying Gravity because it's just the craziest thing that I'm actually doing this. Like it's wild. Uh, so that was my first experience. And then in, in, the, in the entire year that I was on tour, I actually only played it twice. Um, I think in Milwaukee once and some other random Midwestern city. And uh, so, you know, I rehearsed it every day and I was there to play that part, but I only got to go on twice. But I got a crazy call at the end of that run, which was a girl in Australia just broke her collarbone or something by riding a bike. Will you fly to Australia to like two days from now to be the standby for Alphaba? And I was like, hell yeah. So I get down to Australia and, and the cool thing about productions of Wicked in I think every other country, but 
ours. The first cover for Alphabet is the alternate, which means they do two shows a week automatically. So I went from doing two shows in a year to doing two shows a week. And for Alphaba, like that is really hard. You gotta, I always kind of liken it to a marathon. Like you gotta rev yourself up for it. You can't just wake up one day and run a marathon. I mean, you could, but you would probably regret it afterward. And doing two shows a week versus two shows in a year was a big transition. Um, but a great learning experience. And I mean, I have friends still today, Australian friends uh, from that production. And then after that production, I got asked to be the standby on Broadway where I ended up going on for 10 shows in a row for one run. So it was, it was really, like I was really proud of myself of the way that I had kind of developed into this role because at, in the beginning, when I was first covering it, I sang, I could sing that show once a week and then I would like practically lose my voice. And, and that's kind of the process that you have to go through is it's a lot of trial and error and you have to realize how to pace yourself. And like my dad said, swinging is, I think the hardest job in show business. I think covering in any sense, being a standby and understudy are the hardest jobs in show business. And it really forces you to be on your toes. I even had a show where I did a mid show Alphaba swap out, which was the most invigorating thing I think I've ever done in my life. Mm. Imagine you're backstage, you're a standby. You most times you're just backstage doing a puzzle or reading a book and you're not doing anything. And I get a, I hear an announcement, Lily Cooper, please report to the Alphaba dressing room. And it's about like half an hour into the show. And I realized that the, the woman playing Alphaba was sick that day and she was vomiting off stage. It was awful, but she was like pushing through until I could get greenified. Normally getting greenified takes around like 20 to 25 minutes. This time it took four minutes. They just literally slap on green paint, throw your costume on. The moment I walk into the wings, I see the Alphaba playing I see the actress playing Alphaba. She sees me with this like look of relief because she just needs to get off stage. It's the switch out right before the song popular. She walks on, I walk, she walks off, I walk on, we high five in the wings and then I walk on stage and I'm playing Alphaba. And I think the funniest thing about this is that I'm solidly five inches taller than her. So, the, so I, probably the first 10 rows of the Gershwin Theater were like, is this a different green person? Like, who is this one? <laughs> There's another one? Um, for everyone else, it was just like, oh, it's a green lady. It's the same person. <laughs> so then they announced that the actress has changed after intermission. Um, but that was the most invigorating, exciting experience, I think, of my entire career. It was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I love it. I can unmute it for a second. Chuck, the light. You won the Tony Award for your incredible star turn as the pimp Memphis. Tell me how life-changing the role of Memphis was, that show, and what the Tony Award meant to you. You can mute me again. Wow. Okay. Um, that's a lot. Um, you know, uh, e every actor, every theater actor really wants to win a Tony. And so... Uh, and, and, and that momentous event happened to me. And, uh, at the time, it, it, you know, it, I, I often describe it to people like, you know, so, so you're sitting there in Radio City Music Hall and uh, I was sitting next to Eddie. I brought, Eddie was my date, my son, Eddie. And, um, and there, you know, that here comes your category. And I think it was Roseanne Barr who was, Given, given the award out, and and she, and she goes, and the the Tony Award goes to Chuck Cooper. She said my name wrong, Chuck Cooper. <laughs> and so, and so I, I describe it as there's a moment in Star Wars. I don't know if you remember Star Wars, where the Millennium Falcon goes into hyperspace, and this and 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 they go, and it's like kind of like slow motion, and you know, it was like that. It was like it was Chuck Cooper, and I went, and I was like, oh my God. so I get up out of my seat and I look back at Eddie and then I look across the aisle and Michael Blakemore and Cy Coleman are there and I walk up 
to the stage and I get to the podium and I look in the back of Radio City Music Hall and there's this huge clock. You got two minutes for your whatever remarks you'd like to make. So I'm, I'm in slow motion until the first word comes out of my mouth and then the clock goes like really fast. And I'm like trying to talk and I get all tongue tied and I, I can't remember what the heck it was I was supposed to say because I just want to turn it. And that's incredible. I mean, you know, it's just, just insane, insane, insane. My favorite part, cause it's on YouTube and I've watched it several times is my brother sitting next to him and my brother's like, dad, get up. You just want to <laughs> go. <laughs> right, because I was like, me? me? I mean, come on. Andre the Shields was in the same category. How well, some people were rooting for Andre that night, too, weren't some? they? Some? <laughs> they were Andre! Yeah. Andre! Oh. Oh. oh my god. <laughs> well, Lily, I want to ask you a about SpongeBob, and I want to ask you about Tootsie. Then she can mute me again. Favorite memories of doing both of those shows? What are they for you? Ah, uh, well, SpongeBob. I SpongeBob was unlike any other show I've ever done because it was, and I think that's because of Tina Landau and the uh, magical, joyous, freeing space that she created. It was it was a it was a rehearsal process that we looked forward to every single day because it was like playing on a jungle gym with your best friends. That's exact. And there were days where I was like, "I'm getting paid for this. This is insane." It was so much fun, and I think the the most exciting thing about it was that it was such a safe space to bring things to the table to 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 offer ideas and the best days were when we'd be like tina i have a terrible idea and she'd be like great show us all and sometimes those terrible ideas would be in the show and it you know terrible i mean like wacky ridiculous wild out of the ordinary and that's what was so fun about it because that show really allowed us allowed us to do that it made some of my best friends um we've sang at each other's weddings. Like it, it just is, it's, it's an incredible group of wackadoos. And another thing that Tina did brilliantly is put like the perfect people in a room together. I really truly believe that if there was one different person in that show, the show would have been drastically different. Um, so the whole experience for SpongeBob and for Tootsie, I gotta say it was getting nominated for a Tony was pretty awesome. <laughs> I, well, I really wasn't expecting that. That was kind of crazy. In fact, I I so wasn't expecting it that I the morning of the um of the broadcast, <laughs> I didn't set my alarm. And it's pretty early, it's like 8:39. Didn't set my alarm. And so I was like, I'm just gonna sleep. I'm not gonna wake up and you know anxiously sit at my television. So and we're all calling little we're like <laughs> Trying, I'm not, like trying to get on the phone. Where is she? Where is she? And, you know, <laughs> beep, beep. I, know. I roll over and my phone's on silent. And I realize that my phone, I have like 40 text messages and 25 missed calls. And I'm like, oh, uh, that must, I guess that's a good sign. Probably not getting 40 calls for not getting nominated for Tony. So <laughs> then, so then eventually like my dad calls me, my mom calls me. They're like, Lily, what have you been? You just got nominated for Tony. <laughs> and I was like still groggy and sleepy. I was like, what are you talking about? So that was a crazy day. And then we had the show that night, which was really exciting. It's always really exciting. I, I, I remember the show after the Tony nominations for Spring Awakening was like this just explosive show. And it was the same for, for Tootsie. It was really, really exciting. Um, so yeah, those are my favorite memories. Nicole, you can unmute. Chuck, I have to ask you, you got to work with Harold Prince in The Prince of Broadway. It was so wonderful to watch you work with him. Tell me what it was like working with Harold Prince and being a part of that show. You can now mute me. Oh, oh my God. Prince of Broadway himself. My, I, there were so many wonderful things about that, but I, I think my favorite, my favorite, most delicious, wonderful thing, uh, about doing that show was 
the moments when Hal would just start telling stories. We would be in rehearsal and he would talk, oh yeah, well, you know, when we were doing West Side Story or when we were doing Kiss of the Spider Woman, or we were, you know, all these, you know, the, 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 the you know, the mega store shows of, of theater history that this man produced or directed or, or whatever. And he would just start telling these stories. And and the one story I, re I remember that I wish they had put in the show, but they, would, they wouldn't put it in the show. He told us that early on uh, that he started wearing glasses, you know, his signature glasses up on his head like that. He started wearing glasses because it made him look smart. And he knew that the suits would would respect him more if he had those glasses on. So they weren't and, prescription? No, they weren't prescription. It was a prop. <laughs> That's so cool. And so, you know, we had we all had these glasses in the show, right? But they never taught they never told that story, which I thought was incredibly endearing, incredibly you know, I mean, that's that's how he was. He thought outside of the box. He he was. And there's there's never been one like him, and there will never be another one. There will, there will, you know, no, you can't follow that act. I mean, come on. I mean, the the list of shows, the hits, the 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 Tony Awards. The I mean, who's going to do that? So, um, it, and and it wound up being his last show. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sit there and, you know, I was sharing a dressing room with Tony Yazbek, the Tony Yazbek, who's like crazy, incredible, talented. Um, and Hal would just waltz into our dressing room and, and we would just be kicking it back in the dressing room with Hal Prince, just, you know, kicking it. Cause he was like a buddy, Hal Prince. I, you know, I, I'll never forget. What, what, you know, when they when they contacted me, he Hal Prince sent me an email, and it said, um, "Dear Chuck, would like to talk to you about a show. Um, give me a call, Hal Prince." Email, right? I'm like, "This is who's doing this? This is not real." Okay, so I I call my agent. I go, you know, I got this email, and I'm pretty sure it's a you know some kind of a prank or something, but. Just so you know, I, I got this email. And they go, um, yeah, it's it's real. It's how Prince wants you to come by the office and talk to him about doing the show. So what if you had just like ignored that? What if you were just like, man, this isn't real? <laughs> <laughs> right? So I go to, you know, his I think he was in it's in Rockefeller uh center, some some you know, high rise fancy place. And I go and and you know, there's Hal Prince, and he says, you know, I, I've I've watched your career, and and I've, and I'm I'm like, you watched my career, <laughs> and and I got the show, and and you know, there's a couple of numbers I want you to do, and uh, you know, what I want you to do, um, uh, Tevian, the fiddler. I said, excuse me. <laughs> Come again. You you want my black self <laughs> to do Tevia? He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can do it. You can do it. You're gonna be great. You go, well, if Hal Prince thinks I can do it, I'll do it. <laughs> and that was the most fun I had in that show. Was was rehearsing that that number with Stro and Hal and and you know, figuring it all out and and being a rich man. I mean, oh my god. So much fun, so much fun, such a, a wonderful, wonderful that experience. Great. And that company, oh, oh my god, that I company. Could talk to you forever. Oh my god. Oh yeah. The company of that show. So Preston yeah. just told me the Verizon man is in our building. It's supposed to be fixed in 10 minutes. Like I said, I could talk to you two forever. Everybody, join them on this Sunday, May 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when they will be live with Seth Radetsky with a rebroadcast Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and they're doing a VIP sound check at 12 noon, which I love these. I cannot wait to watch the two of you at 12 noon doing your sound check with Seth Rudetsky. They are hilarious. They are the best behind the scenes. Once again, tickets are available at Broadway World Events at SethConcertSeries.com. Lily, congratulations to you and your husband on your beautiful 
arrival that's going to happen in September. Thank you so much. The very best. We're very excited. Chuck, the same to you. I love you too. I'll see you all near the building. I'll see you all soon. Take care, everyone. All right, all right Richard. Us.